This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. My guest today, uh, David Puth, who is the CEO at Center, and Kim Hamilton Duffy, who is the Director of Identity and Standards at Center. And Center, of course, is best described, I think, as an open source technology project. It was launched by some of the, the founding uh, members of Circle and Coinbase. Uh, one of their offerings is USDC, uh, which is uh, a large, uh, one of the world's largest stable coins. But welcome to the show, David and Kim. Andy, it's great to be here. Thank you for having us. Yes, thanks for having us. Hey, it is a pleasure. Great to have you guys here. So, look, I think um, uh, before we just dive into what Center is, maybe we can we can learn a bit more about what Center is as we go. But let's uh, do what we do at the beginning of the show, which is just get a brief introduction uh, from the two of you. So, uh, David, if if you want to go first, maybe just yeah, love to hear a bit of, about your uh, background and, and journey leading up to Center. Andy, thanks very much for asking. Uh, so I have spent my entire career in the world of financial services in some form or another. Uh, my The first part of my journey was spent running sales and trading businesses, primarily at JP Morgan. And then I ran uh, what is really the large, the world's largest settlement organization for the global foreign exchange market, uh, a heavily regulated company called CLS, which provides uh, all of the payment and settlement for the institutional foreign exchange market. And I was drawn into the crypto market by just believing after seeing financial services work as I did, that the world of decentralized finance and cryptocurrencies really represent the future. And I was very pleased to have the opportunity to work first uh, with a company in the permissions blockchain space and then joining Center at the end of 2020. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, David. And... Uh, Kim, please uh, please do the same thing. Love to uh, yeah hear a bit about yourself. Sure. Yeah, my uh, background is is definitely not finance. Um, most of my career has been being a software developer, architect, um, focusing on distributed systems, uh, sometimes called big data uh, applications of that, and um, and algorithms. And so, I had been reading about blockchain and crypto space casually. Um, and, you know, it was very interesting kind of intellectually. And then I had an opportunity to work with MIT Media Lab in 2016 to work on decentralized verification of learning credentials. And so that's where blockchain came in. And we were interested in the aspects of portability and control and of of identity credentials effectively. And so that kind of forked into two rabbit hole slash obsessions of, you know, being fascinated with blockchain and and this other area of decentralized identity and um, and the idea of um, you know the ability to reduce artificial barriers. So you know most of my career till now has been focused on um, employment and educational opportunities, but the economic opportunities really stood out. And so that that led into uh, meeting with some folks at Center and learning how decentralized identity could play into uh, some use cases that they were very interested in. So, um, so yeah, that's how I ended up there probably about six months ago. Fantastic. Thank you, Kim. And yes, you're, you're exactly right. I think one of the things that we're going to focus today's discussion on is uh, this set of decentralized identity protocols uh, that that you guys at Center have been working on and, and have released. And so just before we do that, uh, perhaps, David, I'd love to hear from you as the CEO, just a, a little bit of a high level summary, I suppose, of uh, what the, the Center Consortium is, uh, who set it up, and um, what, what are the primary goals? Great. Thank you, Andy. Center was originally conceived uh, as an organization that I can say very clearly was intended to help bring greater trust to the crypto ecosystem. And this was, we'd work, the idea was to work on technical and governance standards to help eventually create a global network of interoperable stable coins, but starting with USDC. So Coinbase and Circle founded Center in 2018, 
to help create this network. And while the company was uh, operational to some extent, I was the first employee that joined uh, at the end of 2020. And we have been working very closely with Coinbase and Circle on uh, trying to advance the growth of USDC. And now more recently, the beginning of the development of uh, an international stablecoin, a series of international stablecoin projects. And to do that, we, we have uh, continued to refine and develop uh, governance standards, technical standards, with Verity being the first major example of ways in which we can help bring trust to this global stablecoin ecosystem. Very nice. And so, Kim, you, as, as the Director of Identity and Standards, um, I suppose I'm sure you're uh, very familiar with uh, this new set of uh, open source identity protocols. I think uh, David referred to it as Verity. Uh, sounds like a, a fun code name. Uh, yeah, so Kim, please, what is Verity all about? Right. Uh, Verity is simply a set of open source decentralized identity. I'm going to come back to what that is, standards and protocols yep. that uh, are intended to bring trust to the crypto ecosystem, all while preserving individual agency and privacy. So let's talk briefly about what is decentralized identity. So um, there are not really any great definitions of it. So I made my own and it is a set of technical standards and principles that are seeking to enable a shift towards more individual control over their digital identities and personal data. So uh, we focus a lot on the technical standards part, but the principles part is sort of the, the um, interesting part that gets um, informed in many different ways. So, you know, sometimes there are uh, personal data regulatory frameworks that that help encode that, but other times that's sort of the guiding, um, you know, sort of the, the, the North Star behind a lot of what the architectures are trying to achieve. Um, and so the, the main idea of contrasting decentralized identity with centralized identity is that often with legacy identity solutions that you use when interacting on the web, a lot of the incentives for identity solutions are not really aligned with your interest. So um, this is a way to shift identity solutions so that it starts to work in your favor so that um, attestations or claims about your identity you can take with you and even things like reputation. So right now, say you have a lot of Twitter followers or say you're in sales and how do you move across platforms? So decentralized identity is a way that tries to shift the dynamics into in the favor of individuals. And Andy, if I could just add to that, one of the things that, that we uh, are very cognizant of is that today there's no real industry standard or agreement on how products and services can interoperate in a number of crypto use cases. And we felt that by the development of Verity, we, we could help the industry, again, bringing trust to the industry to standardize some of these practices. And I think you'll see that as we go through some of the areas where we think Verity can be applied. Yeah, that, that makes sense, David. And one of the things that I always think about when we start to talk about um, decentralized identity and uh, privacy, um, cryptography, you know, all, all these kind of tenants of, of blockchain and of Bitcoin. And it, it goes right back to, you know, things like the original uh, cypherpunk uh, manif manifesto. And like, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, uh, yeah, well, it, it is called the, the Cypherpunks Manifesto written by Eric Hughes back in, I've got it here. When was that written? 1993. I'm just going to uh, read a couple of paragraphs because it's quite interesting. And I think it, uh, I'd, I'd love to get you guys' perspective on this. But, you know, Eric uh, introduces it by saying that a privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Privacy is not secrecy. A private matter is something one doesn't want the whole world to know. But a secret matter is something one doesn't want anybody to know. And privacy is the power to selectively uh, reveal oneself to the world. 
it's just a really uh, elegant language, I think. And there's obviously- uh, Absolutely, and truly prescient in terms of seeing both what the world needs and frankly, leading to some of the things that we think we've been working on to try to develop. Yeah, that's that's right. And I think all of this is, it's never been in more stark contrast, I think. You know, it feels like the world is kind of, all these trends are starting to come together. Everything is accelerating at the moment. And, you know, you just have need to look at what, what is happening in the Ukraine uh, and, you know, on, on one side, people are using uh, all, all the different uh, cryptographic protocols to be able to easily and freely donate crypto to people in Ukraine, which has been amazing to see. Uh, but there's also on, on the flip side, there's a, there's a lot of people calling for people to pretty much almost put a blanket ban on uh, Russian users of everything from social media platforms uh, to uh, exchanges such as Coinbase. And look, I mean, there are no easy answers uh, to this, but yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear from you guys um, any kind of uh, perspectives or, or opinions on, on how you think this plays out and um, why, the, why it is important to have uh, these kind of open standards that everyone can start to agree on. You've hit upon an issue that we've spent a bunch of time talking about over the last week as this crisis has unfolded. I'm going to let Kim start off and maybe I'll add uh, afterward. Okay, so uh, yes, that's a great question. And we have been discussing this topic a lot at Center. And I think the main thing we want to emphasize is that uh, we don't want to suggest that cryptocurrency or verity is, is an answer or a, a problem. Um, and we want to emphasize our desire for a swift and peaceful outcome with this tragic situation. Um, there have been several very interesting observations related to this. So first of all, being that people around the world have been able to donate crypto to uh, Ukrainian government directly. And so um, as of recently, I think that donate the donations to uh, government and private channels have topped close to 40 million US dollars. And the government has been able to spend around 10 million uh, directly on critical supplies. And so that's uh, a, a very interesting case where crypto has been able to be directed, uh, you know, to the people who, who need it to provide these, these critical supplies. Um, I think some interesting things that have come up around identity are in the Ukrainian government, um, once they announced that they were accepting cryptocurrency donations, instantly questions come up around how do you establish authenticity and identity? And so, fraud prevention, the ability to verify that that address belongs to an individual or entity is one case where identity comes, comes into play. I think that another question there is around, um, you know, the, the, the sort of banning case that you mentioned. And I think in that one, that's, that's a, a question that I'll deflect slightly. Um, I think that that's a case where it's unfortunate because while it might while it might be done to sort of freeze transactions for certain targeted individuals, um, you know, a lot of other people, a lot of you know, uh, citizens, individuals may be caught up in that process. And so, how are you interfering with um, you know with their livelihoods? And so that is something that is a much bigger question. But I think in terms of the um, you know, ability to help mitigate or identity and cryptocurrency applied to cryptocurrency to be able to rapidly uh, uh, direct money to individuals who need it, but then also with this identity layer to be able to say, you know, this is this is who I think it is. Um, a tremendous opportunity to help avoid fraud that unfortunately happens in in cases like this. Yeah, I, I would just echo Kim's sentiments is that we we believe here that this is a unique opportunity and the world has watched as as uh, cryptocurrency and other related uh, AIDS funds have poured into Ukraine. We think it is a force for good and that's where we're uh, where we're most focused. 
Uh, but as Kim said, the, the Verity protocol will ultimately enable uh, aid to get to where it needs to get to, to the right people, to the right addresses. And that's that's the area where we want to put our heaviest focus now. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, David and Kim, thank you for that. And I, I suppose you know there are just uh, there are no easy answers. There are no easy solutions. Um, it's it's just a, a, a big old mess, unfortunately. And at the same time, while there are some some fairly intense tensions going on, it, it does feel like uh, one way or another, um, just the global events. And I'm not even just talking about uh, the Ukraine situation, but it's it's everything that's happening. You know, it's the pandemic, um, maturing technology. Everything is uh, just starting to accelerate uh, what we could originally call, I don't know, call it what you like, you know, the Bitcoin revolution or, or, or the blockchain uh, revolution. Um, everything is starting to accelerate. We've got... Uh, the critics are as critical as ever, but one thing that has struck me, uh, David and Kim, and you probably have a, a better perspective on this than me, as uh, as uh, people that are, are based in the US at least, um, the increasing dialogue uh, from US regulators and even US politicians, the Crypto is is much more a, a point of discussion, and from both sides of the aisle, uh, there are detractors uh, and supporters, and it's it's a little bit of a partisan issue. But there are uh, yeah detractors and supporters on on both sides that have kind of uh, flipping and reversing their positions, if if that makes sense. So yeah, I'd just be curious to, as to how you guys uh, see that um, yeah crypto discussion. Uh, ever ever more on the global stage, if you like. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is somewhat remarkable that uh, the amount of attention that crypto is now receiving from uh, regulators and policymakers globally, but a great deal of attention from uh, the political side in the US. We think overall, that's a very good thing. It's, it's brought a level of attention and uh, greater legitimacy to understanding the crypto ecosystem. We think there have been a number of very credible arguments in favor of how crypto can be more broadly adopted. Uh, our focus is primarily on the stablecoin ecosystem. And I think you've seen most recently with the president's working group, followed by a series of, of meetings in uh, in Congress regarding the, how stablecoins should be governed. We are very supportive of those discussions. We believe that there are a number of different avenues by which private stablecoins can be issued. And actually we've been uh, generally very impressed uh, with the quality of the discussion uh, that's gone on. So we think it's, it's going to help very much advancing uh, the work that we're doing initially on USDC and ultimately on this global network of stablecoins. Circle and Coinbase have both been real leaders in the field of helping drive uh, regulation to first understanding what's happening uh, in stable coins, but ultimately to come with, with, with strong supportive legislation that will both support innovation in the US, uh, but also enable the ultimate promise of what we think stable coins can do to be realized by a greater part of the population. So it's it's an impressive discussion. Again, our focus has been primarily on the stablecoin legislation, legislative work, uh, and we think it's been a very positive development. Well, yes. that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, if that's the case, um, yeah, I'd understand that uh, you guys are, are all over the, the stablecoin uh, stuff. And yeah, you're right. There's been a lot of discussion uh, about stablecoins as well. I'd love to just hear you guys just kind of frame the argument for uh, the importance of stablecoins and how you see um, some of the regulators, what what is their position on this, and also uh, kind of contrast that with uh, uh, the case uh, for something like a, a a digital dollar or a central bank um, digital currency, you know, and the, the importance of having a, uh, a an independent, uh, robust stablecoin ecosystem at, at the same time as something like a, a central bank digital currency. Great. Well, why don't I why don't I kick this off and then hand it over to Kim? Uh, I think there are, 
the, the developments on the central bank digital currency side have been interesting and encouraging. And we think that there are certain use cases where uh, it's, it's likely to uh, be something that will be adopted in certain countries around the world. But in the US in particular, I think it's been, uh, it's been fairly clearly stated that we, are, we still have a good amount of time uh, necessary to really answer all the questions about uh, a US central bank digital currency or a digital dollar. The important note is that stable coins uh, are here today and dollar stable coins with nearly $150 billion in circulation today, it's, uh, it's apparent that the US is in many ways leading the world in terms of innovation and development. And part of our role at Center is, is to keep that innovation moving forward. So we're, uh, we're very excited about the progress we've seen with USDC. We think there is a place in the future for a world where central bank digital currencies and stable coins interoperate uh, as we expect stable coins and various designs will interoperate going forward. Uh, but today, stable coins are out there being actively used in uh, an almost infinite number of use cases. And we think continuing to make the investment in the development of private stable coins is, is a very good path for us to take. And lastly, and just I'll base this in part on some on personal experience working in the regulated world, I think regulators and policymakers in general would like to see private sector solutions to issues such as the one we're dealing with in, in stable coins, uh, trying to find private sector solutions that could help pave the way for something that could be adopted by a broader public in the years ahead. So we're, we're pleased with the progress and we think that we're getting the right kind of support from the regulatory community. In one area that I'd add is, you know, in terms of preserving the crypto ethos, one area that we're, very passionate about is the ability to uh, preserve open networks and open standards. And that's yes. been part of, um, you know, part of Center's formation. And, you know, to David's point, definitely interoperability has to be a goal because, you know, it seems likely both will coexist. But when you think about what are the barriers to um, open networks, open solutions, and uh, you know, thinking about the regulatory considerations that are coming up, we see Verity and our approach to identity as, as really an opportunity. And um, so we're saying, okay, there, there are real regulatory obligations and considerations that come up, but approaching that using legacy identity approaches is, is not necessarily the way to go It introduce either closed systems or uh, you know, potential silos or uh, of identity data uh, that can be risky. And so what we're seeing this is the ability to meet regulatory obligations um, without necessarily leaking personal identity data and enabling a, basically a better approach to identity, uh, digital identity, where individuals can, can control their data. So the idea, and, and we see it as starting the conversation. So, you know, if we could preserve the capability for say forensics in, investigations by appropriately authorized parties and, and not get in the way of that, but without exposing sensitive data to smart contracts, putting it on chain or any other sort of uh, risky way like that, then we, um, we can support these parties to do what they need to do, but um, balance that with privacy considerations of individuals and uh, not diminish the, the current value prop of DeFi and you know definitely not not going in against the crypto ethos. So that's that's sort of how we're approaching it and working with the regulatory community to say, okay, here's a here's a solution that might give you that lets you do what you want and leads to better outcomes for individuals. And so how can we work with you to um, make sure that this is an approach that 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 you're comfortable with. Sure, and and Kim, as much as you're obviously working with uh, people on on the regulatory side, uh, I can see. I was just looking through the the Verity launch partners. You've also got a number of 
there's a number of big names from across the crypto ecosystem uh, that have I think uh, joined Verity as, as launch partners or given commitments to collaborate on um, upcoming projects so just running through i can see you've got obviously a center co-founder coinbase uh, algorand compound labs consensus uh, hadera hashgraph ledger metamask uh, phantom technologies i don't know who they are but um, the solana foundation the stellar development foundation so there's a lot of um yeah big names there right from across uh, you know the wider uh, blockchain ecosystem so you've been working with some of these projects uh, for some time and, and they're obviously uh, committed to helping you guys uh, build out Verity then, right? That's correct. And I think what's been great to see from all of these partners is there's uh, emerging recognition of decentralized identity types approaches and the value that it, that it provides. So, um, you know, it's, it's the, uh, ideally suited to the kinds of, of challenges that people are increasingly interacting. And it's not just the uh, sort of regulatory kinds of considerations that, that we've talked about. So some other ones might be enabling individuals and institutions to interact more confidently with the crypto and DeFi ecosystems. So a catchphrase there might be no rug pull NFTs. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah. then also enabling better uh, offering. Uh, for explain what that means, though, Kim. Because I, I mean, I know what you mean. But how? So how would that work? Because that's that is that's a great use case and it's a great example. Because uh, that's a huge problem at the moment. Um, is exactly that. You know, rug pull uh, NFTs, and this is what happens with happened in DeFi as well. As soon as you've got a, and it happened in ICOs. As soon as you have a a kind of super hot innovative new technology market you do attract a, a lot of capital and a lot of talent but at the same time unfortunately it, it attracts a lot of fast money a lot of hustlers scammers as well and we're seeing those kind of problems play out at the moment uh, in nfts so yeah i'd love to kind of understand uh, how these kind of new uh, decentralized identity uh, protocols and standards can help just mitigate a small amount of that Exactly. And uh, I should be clear that in the initial launch of Verity, we haven't included support for that, but maybe we should. Sure. But in but, the future, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but certainly, yes, the approach of um, dealing with some form of, of mitigation of, you know, so you don't necessarily want to build a solution that requires people to upload their driver's license to you know participate in uh, the nft market so there's there's all kinds of very high stakes approaches to identity verification that that yeah. might be used to sort of help whether it's um avoid make sure someone's a real person or to make sure that if something goes wrong you know how to investigate that. So that's where decentralized identity types of claims come in because you don't want to force people to over identify. You don't want to have, have their data spread everywhere. And in fact, you probably don't even want to know who they are beyond the fact that it's a human. But if something goes wrong, there are some parties that, that, that want to be able to look into that. And so um, that's really where these, these solutions come in. And, um, you know, so I think definitely um, in terms of NFTs specifically, it's, it's not just the, um, you don't want to add too much friction. I think that with that specific use case, I think it would ruin all the fun. So, <laughs> yeah, part of, part of it is down to the, the marketplaces. Um, and I think some of them are starting to understand that, uh, it is just too easy for a team of completely anonymous founders to spin up a scam and you know no one knows who they are and but i mean it, it's also a lot of the responsibility unfortunately or fortunately rationally it does fall on you know the individual investor it comes back to you have to do your own due diligence and take responsibility for for your own decisions but man it's just um it's it's a it's a hard one, but and also what about the idea of um, I've seen people talk about uh, 
on-chain reputational system so you can kind of still have your real world identity hidden but you could um you could set up a a, a kind of a, a trusted history of participation in DAOs or other NFT projects and, and things like that and kind of build up a, a trusted on-chain uh, identity uh, that then gives you the right to, um, yeah, earn a bit of trust, if that makes sense. I, I yeah, think you've just this... defined very well one of our one of our principal use cases, and I think that, that that's exactly right, is that... Uh, what Verity ultimately will enable uh, the user to do is to provide, again, only that information that's absolutely necessary uh, to participate in a certain activity, but can validate whether it's proof of education, whether it's, uh, it's, it's a, a credit score, it's a KYC credential, it's proof of insurance, ultimately accredited investor status. It's any one of a number of things yes. that could help uh, an individual build up an identity that could be accepted in various use forms. And one thing I'd like to add to that is that with Verity's approach, decentralized identity approaches and standards, um, you can also add nuance to what, ne what absolutely needs to be on chain because often you know, there's very little that you need on chain. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons, uh, uh, dif difficulty or impossibility deleting and also storage and things like that. But, uh, but ver verifiable credentials are off chain and can help serve as a bridge among chains. So when you're looking at sort of cross chain portability and uh, sort of privacy control consideration, say if a person doesn't necessarily want to have their um, that data on chain, or if they want to have a credential that that captures some uh, sequence of on chain activities, um, you know that that's where this sort of portable, verifiable credentials come in as well. I like it. Sounds good. All right. Well, let's let's finish off this part of the podcast uh, team. And then we'll go to a break. Then we'll come back. We'll finish off. We'll have some fun. We'll do the very famous uh, crypto conversation hot take round. Excited to see uh, where that goes with you guys. But let's uh, before we go to the break, let's just give you both a, a quick opportunity. Just kind of uh, yeah, some some final thoughts on on Verity, where it's heading next and um, where people can go to learn more um, and, you know, potentially get involved. Well, maybe maybe I'll start and let, let Kim, who's the architect here, close that off. Uh, it, it's important if we look back on what the developments have been over the last uh, year in terms of our build up to this project and, and really the close working partnership that we have with Circle and, uh, and as well, Block being involved uh, as a launch partner. Today, Verity is, it's an open standard. It's accessible to anyone. There's a development portal that people can come into and, and work and contribute to the standards. But where the real excitement will come as will be as people begin and entities begin to build product on top of this that will enable some of these, uh, these unique use cases that, that Kim and I have described over the course of the conversation. Uh, we think Verity is, is just one additional step in bringing more trust to the crypto ecosystem. And we're really looking forward to working with our, uh, our launch partners and development partners to help build real applications to help the crypto universe going forward. But Kim, let me hand that over to you to close it up. Yeah, and there are two layers that I think we found are especially resonating with people. So one would be, uh, you know, obviously looking at that list of partners, people are really interested in consuming credentials that that these partners understand or use, or say certainly if you're dealing with something like a KYC credential or accredited investor, if that's something that you know Circle is issuing, then um, you know then that's that's a useful thing for you to be aware of and know uh, know how to consume it, use it in your use cases. So I think the in terms of what goes in the credential, what sort of uh, claims are being made, how uh, how to use that, how it how it works both in wallets and on chain. Um, that's one direction, and I think that's been an especially exciting uh, part 
although I realize now I say it out loud, it doesn't sound exciting at all, but the developing the schemas with, um, with our partners with a view to compliance and fit for purpose for, for different use cases and privacy. Um, that's that's been a really exciting opportunity, I think, for the entire space, for the entire crypto DeFi space. Um, then the other layer is on fostering interop for this uh, for identity credential exchange. And as you know, some of our other partners are, are really focusing on that a lot. I guess block really stands out. So um, that's another area where we're really focusing on how to uh, enable this this glue um, and how to make it easy for wallets and uh, consumers to uh, share, consume credentials. Awesome. Well, you guys are doing excellent work and I wish you are nothing but the best as you continue to really put in the hard yards and, and do the necessary work uh, that must be done. So I said we'd go to a break. Let's do that and then we'll come back. We'll have some fun. We'll finish off with the Crypto Conversation Hot Take Round. In today's crypto market, the team at Brave New Coin are the sector's leading builders of custom crypto indices. BNC's powerful indexing engine draws on Brave New Coin's premium data to calculate high-frequency intraday and end-of-day indices for a wide range of index products. BNC's custom indices help you to gain exposure to the crypto assets class and track your performance against the market without having to become a stock picker. Not sure what you need? A Brave New Coin consultant can help you assess your requirements. Contact BNC today to find out more. All right, we're back, and I'm with uh, David Puth, who is the CEO at Centre, and Kim hamilton Duthie. She is uh, Director of Identity and Standards at Centre. And, uh, well, David and Kim, I like to finish each podcast with a quick round of rapid-fire crypto conversation hot takes. Are you up for it? Absolutely. I think <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Don't worry, guys. It'll be fun. Uh, let's do this. I'll just I'll I'll take it take it in turns since we've got two of you. Uh, but there's no right or wrong way to do this. Uh, just a bit of fun and, and see what your what your opinions are. Uh, let's start with you, David. Um, on where would you say that you sit on the Bitcoin uh, maximalist uh, to multi-coin opportunist spectrum? I think I sit uh, at right around the 60% level, uh, where I believe firmly in the future of Bitcoin, but I am dazzled by what I'm seeing in the development of many other coins today. Yep, that makes uh, a lot of sense. Very calm and, and rational response, David. I like it. Uh, Kim, let's go to you. What would you say is your firmest conviction, uh, crypto opinion? Oh, wow. Um, let's see, maybe can I work in Satoshi's identity in some way? Please. Um, let's see. Yeah, you know, I'm not so sure of that anymore. I was going to say, uh, Satoshi is a collective, not a single person, but I think I've changed my mind recently. So I am not sure I have a single strongest conviction though. That's all right, but that's fascinating. Uh, nonetheless, yeah, Satoshi could be a group, could be, could be a single person alive or dead no one knows i think it would be best if um if we kept it that way but we all have our theories don't we <laughs> let's go to you david um as i like to say or bill gates likes to say more accurately uh, we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. so look whatever you like here could be uh, blockchain DeFi crypto in general what does it look like in 10 years time I'll, I'll give two predictions about which i feel very strongly and one is that there will be a very well uh, developed decentralized uh, DeFi community uh, and one that has actively begun to interact with traditional finance and that secondly there will be a fully interoperable network of stable coins allowing every individual around the world with right access the ability to move money at the speed of the internet for a fraction of the cost of what moving money takes today i love it all right kim 
sci-fi author William Gibson famously said that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Uh, can you think of an example of the future being here right now, but most people just aren't really aware of it? Right. I think that what we are seeing in um, Web3 use cases, I've, I've been really excited that I feel like the future that I thought was probably more five to ten years away, I'm starting to see. So a lot of these areas in decentralized identity and portable reputation and uh, things like that, I think that we're starting to see approaches like that accelerate in the, the sort of thing I've been working for, I feel like for, for many years in terms of opening up economic opportunities, removing gatekeeping, um, I feel like we're, we're starting to see that more and more, um, you know, like, like it or not with DAOs. And I think that that's been really exciting to see that these elements that I thought were, were far away are, are accelerating and that, um, we're in a good place to be a part of it and, and help individuals. Wonderfully said, Kim. Thank you for that. Let's start to finish this off, team. Uh, we'll get we'll get the uh, we'll go to you both, uh, David. Let's do you first. Uh, the final question is: What is your favorite science fiction a book, a film, TV show, or universe? <laughs> I'm going to go back to something very traditional, and uh, I I was a longtime Star Wars fan, and I continue to see what I saw in Star Wars as kind of the future of where we're going today. So that's that's where I would go out. Hey, Star Wars, it's it's the original, it's the classic. There's uh, there's no problem with Star Wars. Uh, Kim, how about yourself? Oh boy, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> so I, I'm really into uh, dystopian sci-fi um, everything, but I think actually in terms of what I would say is my favorite is actually, um, I always like Christopher Nolan's takes on um, time travel and, um, you know, sort of weird uh, uh, physics and everything. So. I would I would collapse everything I would have said into a single movie Interstellar that I'm obsessed with, especially that uh, portrayal of in the uh, hyperdimensional library. So I'm gonna go with that. Yeah, nice. That that's a, that's a great answer. And I just watched um, Tenant quite recently, and um, yeah, it's ex exactly that same. Uh, yeah, the way he plays with time and physics, it's just really interesting and quite unique, isn't it? Yes, and I've watched that movie um, probably ten times to try to <laughs> try to make sense. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, none of, none of his movies uh, are um, yeah they're not easy viewing. They're compelling but strange. <laughs> yes, yes, I love it. This has been fun, guys. Um, thank you for coming on the show. I know the fairly um, fairly heavy duty subjects, and it's um, yeah it's a. It's a strange time for the world uh, at the moment, but um, I'm sure we'll come through. But look, I just love to uh, finish this off. Feel free to any final thoughts. Please tell people uh, where they can find you if you have your own uh, Twitter profiles or uh, what the, the the best websites are uh, for Circle and Verity and so on. Well, if you start by just going to Circle.io, you'll find, or excuse me, to Center.io, you will find Center. You can also go to Circle and Coinbase uh, to, to find the work that we're doing together. So that would be a good place to start. Uh, we have a handful of tw Twitter profiles as well as uh, LinkedIn. Kim has a very special Twitter profile. Maybe she can close it out with that. <laughs> My Twitter profile, uh, Kim D. Hamilton. And, um, but yes, we also... Um, from Center IO, we have a link to the Verity Dev Docs. If anyone's interested in checking that out, and um, yeah, reach out to us. Awesome, thank you, David. Thank you, Kim. All the best, and bye for now. Andy, thanks for having us. All right, there you go. That was uh, David and Kim from Center. Uh, that was an interesting chat. And as I say, it is a, a kind of an intense time in the world. Um, yeah, I don't know how all this plays out, but it does feel like, 
yeah, crypto is more on the world stage uh, than ever. Like, amazing, but strange to see, like, Bitcoin jump, I don't know, 20% in the last 24 hours. That was unexpected. Um, mm, mm, not quite sure to make uh, uh, what to make of all this. I'm going to do a, another podcast tomorrow, I think, where I'll just talk to myself and go through some of the things that I'm seeing on Twitter and so on. So, uh, yeah, look out for that tomorrow probably in the meantime thanks for listening everyone don't forget to subscribe to the crypto conversation in whatever podcast app you are using uh, but that's it for today this was the crypto conversation for brave a new coin see you